Om Magyana Timirandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschacha De Satarine Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasanti Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna. Welcome everyone to our Bhakti Shastri study of the Bhagavad Gita. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So we're going to begin chapter chapter 18 tonight. I'll just uh, share. Let's see. Um, before we go into Bhagavad Gita, we we'll have a revision. Can everyone see this chart? Can you see the green the green diagram? Uh-huh. So you see that this is a just a summary of the the chapters which we covered. Very brief. But from thirteenth chapter it was mentioned how the modes of nature affect the qualities of the living entity. So then chapter 14, which was describing the modes of nature, followed. And in chapter 14, it was described that we should cultivate bhakti to overcome the modes of nature. But by doing devotional service, we can transcend the material nature. Then chapter 15 described the banyan tree. On the higher branches, we have the demigods. And on the lower branches, you have... Who's the living in the lower branches of the banyan tree? Yes. Who else? The animals. Yes, right. Animals also. The demons. The demons, yeah, right. So, the, on the higher branches you have the, the divine, the demigods with the good qualities. On the lower branches you have the demons. So that was chapter 16, the divine and demoniac nature. Then it was described how those with divine qualities, they will follow Shastra. And because they follow Shastra, they get good results. But the demons, they don't follow Shastra. They don't care for Shastra. 
So then chapter 17 began with Arjuna's question. He wanted to know what happens when somebody does not follow Shastra, but they have faith in some process which they're following, some religious process they may follow. They have faith in it, but they have no Shastras to support it. So that was described to be like the, 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 their situation will depend on their situation in the modes of nature. Their faith will be in the modes, will be either in goodness or passion or ignorance, according to their situation in the modes of nature. And then at the end of 17th chapter it was mentioned that if they chant Om Tat Sat, then you can bring in some bhakti. It will develop, the bhakti will develop by the chanting of the holy name through Om Tat Sat. Right? So that's uh, a very brief review of the chapters which we've been covering. So now we'll go on. Bhagavad Gita. All right. Chapter 18. Would someone like to read? Anybody can read? Translation? 18.1? Arjuna said, Hare Krishna, mm. Maharaj. Mm. Arjuna said, O mighty armed one, I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation, yaga, and of the renounced order of life, anyasa, O killer of the Kesi demon, master of the senses. Right. So Arjuna has a question again. Something similar to what was asked in the third chapter and the fifth chapter. It's about work. Somebody who doesn't work and somebody who works without attachment to the results. So it's a good question. He wants to know the difference between sannyas and tiaga. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, actually Bhagavad Gita is finished in 17 chapters. We've completed everything. This 18th chapter is a supplementary summarization of the topics discussed be before. In every chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna stresses that devotional service unto the Supreme Person, Personality of Godhead, is the ultimate goal of life. This same point is summarized in the 18th chapter as the most confidential path of knowledge. In the first six chapters, stress was given to devotional service. Yogi nam apisarvesham. Of all yogis or transcendentalists, one who thinks, who always thinks of me within himself, is best. In the next six chapters, pure devotional service and its nature and activity were discussed. And then in the third six chapters, knowledge, renunciation, the activities of material nature and transcendental nature and devotional service were described. It was concluded that all acts should be performed in conjunction with the Supreme Lord, represented by the words Om Tat Sat which indicate Vishnu, the Supreme Person. The third part of Bhagavad Gita has shown that devotional service and nothing else is the ultimate purpose of life. This has been established by citing past Acharyas and the Brahma Sutra, the Vedanta Sutra, 
So like this, Prabhupada is explaining to us that the, the whole purpose of this Bhagavad Gita is to bring us to the consciousness of devotional service that ultimately is devotional service which is being stressed here in the Bhagavad Gita. After six chapters, Krishna had concluded that, and then seven to twelve was all about devotional service, and now we've, we've finished the third section of the Bhagavad Gita, 13 to 17, and the conclusion is devotional service also. And so Prabhupada is just bringing this to our attention that ultimately it's just devotional service which is being described. Although other processes are mentioned, what's really being asked for is devotional service. And then looking at the uh, second last paragraph, Prabhupada says, as in the second chapter, a synopsis of the whole subject matter was described. In the 18th chapter also, the summary of all instructions is given. Right? The second chapter was the contents of the Bhagavad Gita, summarized. So here also the 18th chapter, it's a summary of all the instructions. The different yoga processes are going to be described. So we'll see uh, to this evening, beginning the first section of the 18th chapter, it's describing about karma yoga, how by action one can come to devotional service. Just like in the first six chapters, it was describing karma yoga. So Krishna is going to summarize the process of karma yoga again. So Lord Krishna replies to Arjuna's question, text number two. Someone please read number two. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. The Supreme Personality of God had said, the giving up of activities that are based on material desire is what great learned men call the renounced order of life, sannyas. And giving up the results of all activities is what the wise call renunciation, tyag. You can read the purpur. Uh, yeah. The performance of activities for results has to be given up. This is the instruction of the Bhagavad Gita. But activities leading to advanced spiritual knowledge are not to be given up. This will be made clear in the next verses. In the Vedic literature, there are many prescriptions of methods for performing sacrifice for some particular purpose. There are certain sacrifices to perform to attain a good son or to attain elevation to the higher planets. But sacrifices prompted by desires should be stopped. However, sacrifice for the purification of one's heart or for advancement in the spiritual science should not be given up. Thank you. And so, uh, I think it's quite clear in Lord Krishna's reply that uh, Tiaga is to give up the results of the activities, but the sannyas is to give up the activities which are based on material desire. Now, activities based on material desire doesn't mean to give up all activities. That would be the mistake. If one thinks, oh, I'm a sannyasi, I, I, I don't do anything now. I've given up all work. Then that's wrong. And sannyas is for purification of the heart. And they can do that by engaging in spiritual activities. Just like if there's Sankirtan, if there's going to be a Sankirtan program, then the sannyasis will come and take part and chant, and they will preach the glories of the Holy Name. 
and the sannyasis will also uh, engage in worship of the deities. Sometimes we see the different sannyasis offering the arti in the morning on the altar. For example, uh, His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami, every morning he likes to be on the altar and offer the Mongol arti to the deities. So one shouldn't think that because he's a sannyasi, he doesn't do anything, but he doesn't do material activities. And Prabhupada mentions some of these uh, sacrifices which are not spiritual. He gives some example of sacrifices which have no spiritual basis. He says, for example, someone wants to have a good son, right? They may do putra yagya. So, you know, that's, a, that's maybe some grihastas may do that, but you know, that's not renunciation, it's a material activity. And somebody may want be thinking about elevating themselves to higher planets. And some people, they do Vedic yagyas and their motive is to go to the heavenly planets. So that's not also the mood of devotional service. We're simply thinking about sense gratification. The sense gratification of having a son or the sense gratification in going to higher planets. It's material. These are material activities. But there are spiritual activities like the Sankirtan Yagya, um, worshipping the deity, these different things. So a devotee gives up the material activities, but they don't give up spiritual activities. This is a difficult point because impersonalists, you see, they, they think that all activities are material. And the Buddhists also think that all activities are material. We have to understand what is actually material and what is spiritual. So a devotee knows what is actually spiritual activity and how to engage in spiritual activities. And they will dedicate themselves in that way. So Krishna enforces this argument, text number three. Could we have someone else read text number three? Some learned men declare that all kinds of fruitive activities should be given up as faulty. Yet others, sages, maintain that acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be abandoned. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be abandoned. Mm. So, we heard how charity, charity can be in the modes of nature. So, we would want to do acts in the mode of goodness. We wouldn't want to act in the mode of passion or ignorance. We have to know how to act in the mode of goodness. Some people say all kinds of fruitive activities should be given up as faulty. So people have to understand what is the purpose of the activity. Are we performing sacrifice, charity and penance just for our own sense gratification to get some material benefit? Or are we actually doing it for purification of the heart? The purpose behind the activity has to be understood. Prabhupada in the purport talks about animal sacrifice. Now, it, animal sacrifice is mentioned in the Vedas. And people make, and st today there are temples, there are temples of Goddess Kali where they perform sacrifice on the dark moon night they bring the goat and they kill the goat and many people come 
I think also, I think in Pashupatinath in Nepal, also they do that kind of thing. The animal was sacrificed. So some people say this is wrong, and others say, no, it's all right, because the animal is going to get a better life. So different opinions about these kind of activities. So Lord Krishna is uh, clarifying, he's clarifying this opinion, what is actually right or not. Text number four continues. Someone please read. Now hear my judgment about renunciation. O tiger among men, renunciation is declared in the scriptures to be of three kinds. Alright, go ahead, read the next verse. Acts of sacrifice, charity and appearance are not to be given up. They must be performed. Indeed, sacrifice, charity and appearance purify even the great souls. So Lord Krishna states, even the great souls can be purified. One, th one should not think, oh, I'm a pure soul, I don't need purification, I'm already pure. <laughs> we, would all, we should all be anxious to get more, to get more purification. We shouldn't be satisfied. So Lord Krishna says, acts of sacrifice, charity and penance are good even for the great souls. Even if you are a great soul, still we need to get more purification. So Prabhupada in the purport talks about uh, different ways in which one can advance, right? Pur Prabhupada says the purport, yogis should perform acts for the advancement of human society. There are many purifi purificatory processes for advancing a human being to spiritual life. And then Prabhupada gives an example how one can advance. He said, the marriage ceremony, for example, is considered to, to be one of these sacrifices. It is called Vivaha Yagya. So should a sannyasi who is in the renounced order of life and who has given up his family relations encourage the marriage ceremony? Well, Srila Prabhupada had the experience that he had gone to the West, he'd given up his family, of course, and taken sannyas. And traditionally, sannyasis, they don't take part in marriage ceremonies. But Prabhupada went to the West, and his students were young people. And he found that they were coming, young men were coming with their girlfriends. And he also learned that the young men and the young women were living together without marriage. So Prabhupada understood that they needed to have marriage, they needed to get married. So when Prabhupada initiated them, he told them also, you can also get married now at this time. So Prabhupada would personally perform the marriage ceremony for them. It was a little unusual to have a sannyasi perform the marriage ceremony. But at that time Prabhupada was alone and he was beginning a new culture, a new society. There was no one there to perform the marriage ceremony. So Prabhupada himself did it and he would perform the marriage ceremony and unite the couple and marry, do a Vedic Yagya. So Prabhupada explains why he did this and he justifies it. He said, uh, the Lord says here that any sacrifice which is meant for human welfare should never be given up. Vivaha Yagya, marriage ceremony, is meant to regulate the human mind so that it may become peaceful for spiritual advancement. For most men, this Vivaha Yagya should be encouraged even by persons in the renounced order of life. Sannyasis should never associate with women, but that does not mean that one who is in the lower stages of life, a young man, should not accept a wife 
in the marriage ceremony. All prescribed sacrifices are meant for achieving the Supreme Lord. Therefore, in the lower stage, they should be given up. They should not be given up, rather. Similarly, charity is for purification of the heart. If charity is given to suitable persons, as described previously, it leads one to advance spiritual life. So, uh, the, the marriage ceremony, Prabhupada considers it to be advancing. It's a method by which young people can advance in their lives that they take more responsibility and they recognize themselves as household. They move from the single person into the married person. It's taking a responsibility, beginning family life. And this is encouraged for people. Prabhupada mentions this for young men to become uh, more responsible if they just simply live together without marriage, it's not good at all. It's against religious principles. So the proper process is young people should be married. And this way they can gradually advance more. Taking a responsibility for a family, helping each other in the family life. The man helps a woman, the woman helps a man. And this way they become more responsible. And so this kind of yagya was in, Prabhupada performed it, it was encouraged. Although usually sannyasis wouldn't, wouldn't bother. Later on, when more people joined the movement, then Prabhupada would have other people perform the marriage yagya. Prabhupada didn't have to do it every time. And similarly with charity, that by giving charity to a qualified person, like some saintly person, one can really make an advancement, because you're, you're doing service for that soul. And the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Mahatsevam dwaram ahur vimuktes. By serving the Mahatmas, you open the doors to liberation. So charity is also encouraged, but should be given to qualified person. Then you can make advancement. So like this, Prabhupada is justifying the use of sacrifice, charity, and penance also. Penance, we should do pe penance, right? What kind of penance we can do? It's not that you have to, not that you have to, torture the body or fast. But we do observe some fasting on holy days, like Ikarasi and Janmashtami. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, by observing holy days, like Ikarasi and Janmashtami, then becomes a mother of devotion for those devotees who take shelter. So certain days are encouraged when we should fast and reduce our... Uh, eating, so on. Okay, going on, text number six. Someone please read the translation. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, all these activities should be performed without attachment or any expectation of result. They should be performed as a matter of duty, O son of Pratha. That is my final opinion. So, should I read? We're, we're just, uh, well, okay, you could read the purport, yeah? Okay, Maharaj. Although all sacrifices are purifying, one should not expect any result by such performances. In other words, all sacrifices which are meant for material advancement in life should be given up. But sacrifices that purify one's existence and elevate one to the spiritual plane should not be stopped. Everything that leads to Krishna consciousness must be encouraged. In the Srimad Bhagavatam also, it is said that any activity which leads to devotional service to the Lord should be accepted. That is the highest criterion 
of religion. A devotee of the Lord should accept any kind of work, sacrifice, or charity which will help him in the discharge of devotional service to the Lord. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Maharaji. So, all these activities should be performed without attachment. So, this is actually karma yoga which is being described, right? Karma yoga means performing one's duty without attachment. This is like niskam karma yoga, without attachment to the fruit of the work. And so this is karma yoga. You see the first six verses have been describing karma, well, first of all Arjuna's question, and then two to six, Lord Krishna is describing karma yoga, work without attachment. This is the idea. This is detached work, karma yoga. So Krishna is summarizing teaching. The the uh, chapter three was about chapter three four. They, they were describing karma yoga, how by action one gets comes to bhakti. So here is the same point: working without attachment, and that will help us to come to devotional service. Then text 7 goes on. Someone read text 7. Yes, Maharaj. Prescribed duties should never be renounced. If one gives up his prescribed duties because of illusion, such renunciation is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Yeah, read the purport. Yeah. Work for material satisfaction must be given up. But activities which promote one to spiritual activity, like cooking for the Supreme Lord and offering the food to the Lord and then accepting the food, are recommended. It is said that a person in the renounced order of life should not cook for himself. Cooking for oneself is prohibited. But cooking for the Supreme Lord is not prohibited. Similarly, a sannyasi may perform a marriage ceremony to help his disciple in the advancement of Krishna consciousness. If one renounces such activities, it is to be understood that he is acting in the mode of darkness. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. So, we know when Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, Lord Chaitanya as a sannyasi, he was often invited to take his food in the home of different brahmanas because generally Mayavadi sannyasis, they will not cook. They don't, they don't like fires, they don't cook. So Lord Chaitanya would bring a servant with him and Sometimes when he's traveling, sometimes his servant would cook for him, um, but oftentimes he would be invited by brahmanas to take food in the home of a brahmana. He would take the food cooked by a brahmana, but the, the, the sannyasi not supposed to cook, but a Vaishnava sannyasi, he will cook. Vaishnava sannyasis cook. Prabhupada was an expert cook. And Prabhupada would have, sometimes he would have his disciples as servants, and sometimes his servants were sannyasis. Just like, uh, well, not always servant, but secretary. His secretary would be sannyasi. Like Satsvarupa Goswami, who traveled as Prabhupada's secretary with him. And sometimes Prabhupada would tell him to go and cook. And that's where Rupa would go in the kitchen and cook for Prabhupada. Other sannyasis also would cook. Uh, Ribati Nandan was a very good cook and he liked to oversee the cooking. Uh, and so, who else? Some other sannyasis cooking. And, no, well, any sannyas can actually go and cook in the kitchen. Because they're not cooking for, for their own self. The idea of devotional service is 
we cook first for Krishna. Whatever we cook is offered to Krishna. We don't cook for our own sense gratification. One time I was at a book fair and we were distributing, we had the book, uh, one of these cookbooks. That one devotee, Kurma Prabhu, the famous cook from Australia, he has a number of cookbooks. And they're very colourful books with pictures of all the different dishes which he prepares. So, in the, in the Buddhist place, people will come, if they look at the book, one time one Buddhist person came and he picked up that book and he said, Oh, he said, this is all sense gratification. And he said, Buddhists, we don't cook food like this. You take food in a Buddhist restaurant, it's, it won't be so uh, tasty, it won't be so uh, attractive. Everything is more basic and plain. They won't use much spices or anything. They don't want sense gratification. You shouldn't be controlled by the tongue. So he could not understand that in the Vaishnava culture, we cook for Krishna. And the cooking is done as an act of devotion for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Of course, the Buddhists, they don't believe in any Supreme Lord. So, they don't have that mood of devotion. But, as devotees, we cook. And we cook for Krishna. So, cooking is not prohibited. Rather, it's a very nice service. The Goswamis, some of the Goswamis were very expert cooks. And they would like to cook, they would cook for the de their deity. So, and then Prabhupada talks about even the marriage ceremony, one can make advancement. Some people think, oh, this is Maya marriage, this is Maya. No, it's devotees make advancement by taking responsibility. It's not wrong. It's a process of purifying the heart. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number eight. Someone can read? Yes. Is said to have renounced in the mode of passion. Such action never leads to the elevation of renunciation. All right. You, you can read purport, okay? Okay. One who is in Krishna consciousness should not give up earning money out of fear that he is performing fruitive activities. If by working one can engage his money in Krishna consciousness, or if by rising early, in the morning one can advance his transcendental Krishna consciousness, one should not desist out of fear or because such activities are considered troublesome. Such renunciation is in the mode of passion. The result of passionate work is always miserable. If a person renounces work in that spirit, he never gets the result of renunciation. Mm. So sometimes people think they've come to Krishna consciousness, they think oh, it's wrong to work. But no, it's not wrong if you give the results of the work for the service of Krishna. In the beginning of the movement, sometimes Prabhupada would tell all the devotees that you should find a job, you should all go to work. The devotees didn't like it very much. But Prabhupada wanted it. He said, no, you have to work, you have to maintain, we have to maintain the temple. I think also uh, in the beginning, Satsvarupa had a job, he was working. And he thought, because the other devotees were not working, he thought he would also give up his job. But Prabhupada said, no. He said, you have to work. He said, we need your salary to pay the rent for our center. So, working is required. We should work. But the results of the work, are meant for the service of Krishna. 
not for sense gratification. So this way working becomes spiritual. And, and this is brought out more in the next verse. Text number 9, someone read. Yes? O oh, Arjun, then man performs his prescribed duty only because it ought to be done and renounces all material association and all attachment to the fruit. His renunciation is said to be in the mode of goodness. Shall I read the purport also? Please, yes. Prescribed duties must be performed with this mentality. One should act with attachment, one should act without attachment for the result. He should be disassociated from the modes of work. A man working in Krishna consciousness is a, in a factory does not associate himself with the work of the factory, nor with the, with the workers of the factory. He simply works for Krishna. And when he gives up the results for Krishna, he is acting transcendently. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, he's acting transcendentally. You give the results for Krishna. That is really detached work. Right? That is detached karma yoga. Hmm. So karma yoga is being described here. So Prabhupada it mentions you may work in a factory, but you don't associate yourself with the work. You don't become, you know, involved so much. You just do the work in a detached manner. And you have to be, other workers are there also, but don't get entangled with the other workers, you know. Don't waste your time talking prajalpa with them. Just, you know, keep a distance. Don't get too much involved in the affairs and the activities of the mundane world. Try to remain a little aloof and just be sure that you're working for Krishna and you give the results for the service of Krishna. Then that is transcendental. That is very good. That is actually the mode of goodness. We do what ought to be done and renounce material association and also renounce the fruit. That is the mode of goodness. Text number 10. Please read someone. The intelligent renouncer situated in the go mode of goodness, neither hateful of an auspicious work, nor attached to auspicious work, has no doubt about work. Shall I read the purport, Maharaj? Please. A person in Krishna consciousness or in the mode of goodness does not hate anyone or anything which troubles his body. He does work in the proper place and at the proper time without fearing the troublesome effects of his duty. Such a person situated in transcendence should be understood to be most intelligent and beyond all doubts in his activities. <laughs> so, neither hateful of inauspicious work nor attached to auspicious work. So some work you may think though is very inauspicious to do this, this is not, I don't like to do this, it's inauspicious. Maybe the time is inauspicious or the place is inauspicious or the work is inauspicious. But devotee doesn't worry about it. Just do the work. Don't be attached. Just do what we have to do. Certain times of the day are Rahu Kala. Oh, this is Rahu, the time of Rahu Kala. I don't want to do any work at this. This is not good. <laughs> but, you know, okay, you're, you're a devotee. You're transcendental. You're above the modes. Don't worry. Just do what you have to do. Krishna will protect you. And going ahead, text 11. Someone read? Yes. It is indeed impossible for an embodied being to give up all activities, but he who renounces the fruits of action 
So, Lord Krishna is saying, you cannot give up all activities. We remember earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, it was said, no one can be idle, not even for a moment. Everyone is forced to act due to the impulses born of the modes of nature. So we cannot give up activities, we cannot stop activities, we have to have activities. But what we can give up is the fruit of action, and that is actually renunciation. You can't give up the work, but you can give up the fruit. And then Prabhupada describes how there are many nice devotees who are working in factories or in offices, and they give the fruit of their work. They're contributing to the Krishna consciousness movement. And Srila Prabhupada calls them highly elevated souls, and they are actually sannyasis, and they're situated in the renounced order of life. Now, we may not think like that. We may not think, oh, that person, he just works in the factory, oh, he's just a, he's got a karmi job. But if they're contributing to the Krishna consciousness movement, they're actually great yogis. They're giving the results of their work. And as far as Prabhupada was concerned, they're actually renounced people. So, Lord Krishna is describing like this a detached work. But now text 12 goes on to describe one who is not renounced. What happens to them? Read number 12, someone. For one who is not renounced, the threefold fruits of action, desirable, undesirable, and mixed, occur after death. But those who are in the renounced order of life have no such result to suffer or enjoy. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody is not renounced, so he enjoys the fruit. The fruit sometimes will be good, sometimes will not be good. And sometimes it will be a mixture, good and bad. But if somebody is actually renounced, detached, right? What happens? A person in Krishna consciousness acting in knowledge of his relationship with Krishna is always liberated. Therefore, he does not have to enjoy or suffer the results of his acts after death. So this is important for Arjuna. Remember, Lord Krishna was describing karma yoga. Arjuna was worried sinful reactions may come on him for doing different things for his activities in the battle. He thought bringing suffering, he will suffer the results of his actions. But Lord Krishna said, if you act in karma yoga, then there's no reaction. So this point is again being brought out, that when you act in karma yoga without attachment to the results, then you don't get any reaction. So this was an important point. So in this way, karma yoga was described up in the first 12 verses. Now the next section, beginning text 13, is going on to describe about jnana yoga. Jnana yoga, the yoga of knowledge, how by knowledge one will also come to devotion. Right? There's no mention of Krishna, 
There's, we're, we're only here, we heard about karma yoga, about work, and how by work we would come to bhakti. Now Krishna is going, Lord Krishna is going to describe how by knowledge we can also come to devotion. We will ask, is there any questions on this first section, the first twelve verses? Anyone has any need for clarification? Maharaj, in one of the purports earlier, it was written by Shla Prabhupada that the demigod worshippers are in the mode of goodness. It was from last class, the worshipper of sun, sun, moon. So how the demigod worshippers can be in the mode of goodness? They are in the mode of passion. Passion, well, we have to consider the, the motivation behind the worship. Somebody is worshipping the demigods, what is their motivation? Why? Are they worshipping the demigods for material desires? There are devotees, there are some people who worship demigods, but they worship the demigods as part of the Supreme Lord. They don't worship the demigods just to get material benedictions but they think of the demigods as being part of the body of the Supreme Lord. So in this way, worship of the demigods can help them to get devotion for the Supreme Lord. So you have to consider, we have to consider what is the motivation in the worship. Uh, why are people worshipping the demigods? Just like the sun god, the sun is the eye of the Lord, right? Mm. Different demigods all represent different parts of the body of the Supreme Lord. So it said, Bharat Maharaj, Bharat Maharaj used to perform yagya, and his yagya was, he would worship different demigods, understanding them to be part of the body of the Supreme Lord. We see Lord Ramachandra in Ramay Ramayana, Lord Ramachandra before going to Lanka, he worshipped Lord Shiva. Why did he worship Lord Shiva? Prabhupada said he was worshipping Lord Shiva. He said he was telling Lord Shiva, I'm going to kill your devotee. <laughs> Ravan was a devotee of Shiva. So Lord Rama told Lord Shiva, I'm going to kill your devotee. But other people, they say Lord Rama worshipped Lord Shiva because he, he wanted to show for the common people material people, ordinary people, material world, that from the Vedas, worship of the demigods is encouraged, because worship of the demigods brings people onto the Vedic path. And they worship the demigods, and they get material benefit, which is temporary. But, because they're on the Vedic path, gradually they will understand that if they worship the Supreme Lord, they can get eternal benefit, they can get the greatest benefit. So, worshipping the demigods is described in the Vedas. It's part of Vedic culture to worship demigods. And most of the Vedas is about demigod worship. And the idea of demigod worship is one will follow Shastra. And gradually follow Shastra, one will then come to worship the Supreme Lord Vishnu. And one can understand, he can get the greatest benefit from worship of Vishnu. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, if the, the demigod worshippers worship them with the desire to go to the heavenly planets, still they are in the mode of goodness, in a sense. Yes, they may go to he heavenly planets. It's material. It's not spiritual, right? They, yes, they want to go to the heavenly planets. So it, it can be in the mode of goodness. They, but... It's not spiritual, that's the point. And it's temporary. You go to the heavenly planets, you can't stay there forever. And so people worship the demigods, and their motive may be good, you know, they're just simply, they want to go to a higher form of a higher planet, they want to experience the life on the higher planets, you could say for sense gratification. 
but people in the higher planets are also obedient to, to scriptures. They're divine. They're not demoniac. And so, in that way, you can understand the mode of goodness is also there. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, nowadays the demigod worshippers like the worship of Durga, uh, uh, as we in North India, the people generally do, we can, nowadays they are, we can see them to be in the mode of passion. Yes, certainly. We see a lot of the mode of passion also in demigod worship. Sometimes people also take them, become in the mode of ignorance, they become intoxicated, and slaughter animals, it's a mode of ignorance. So there is influence of the modes of nature. That's the problem with being in the modes of nature, that sometimes you may be in the mode of goodness, next minute you may be un under the mode of passion or under the mode of ignorance. Because there's always some competition for supremacy between the three modes. So without coming to the mode of pure goodness, one cannot just simply maintain the mode of goodness. That's the problem with the worship of the demigods. They, they worship the demigods, they're, they're in the mode of goodness one minute, next minute they're in the mode of passion or ignorance. It's not pure goodness. You want pure goodness, you have to worship the Supreme Lord Vishnu or Krishna. That's the point. So people should realize that when they worship the demigods. Of course, we saw Brigamuni. Brigamuni was sent by the demigods to go to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva to study who was the supreme. And so Brigamuni found out how, you know, Brahma was offended because Brigamuni didn't offer obeisances to him. And Lord Shiva got really angry when Brigamuni told him, don't touch me. But when he went to Lord Vishnu, he kicked Lord Vishnu in the chest. <coughs> and Lord Vishnu got up and said, oh, my dear Brigamuni, I hope you did not hurt your foot on my hard chest. So Brigamuni was just amazed to see how transcendental Lord Vishnu was, that he didn't get disturbed by the behavior of Brigamuni. But Brahma and Shiva did. So he could understand the, the elevated position of Lord Vishnu, that he's far above the position of Brahma and Shiva. But Brahma and Shiva are certainly chief among the demigods. So these examples are there in the scriptures to guide people. Yes? What? Yes, that's right. Different scriptures for different kinds of people. Just like when, when Lord Chaitanya was preaching to the Chankasi, he quoted, a, he quoted a verse how in the Kali Yuga, uh, you know, Ashwamedha kavalam yam sanyasam parapaitrakam. There's a verse in the Puranas which said, you shouldn't perform an Ashwamedha yagya, you shouldn't perform a government, a horse sacrifice or a cow sacrifice, and you shouldn't take sanyas in the Kali Yuga. And so Lord Chaitanya quoted this verse to the Chan Kasi. But Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. And so the point is that that verse from this is from one of the Puranas, which is not meant for people in the mode of good people, it's meant for people in the mode of ignorance or passion. But in the mode of goodness, there is sannyas. We know Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya and Lord Chaitanya all took sannyas. But one has to be properly situated. So you have to know which scriptures to apply. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, we have Gita and Yulika, Mataji. Yes, Gita and Yulika, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Maharaj, verse number. 10, 
number 14.25, uh, 14.22, that is uh, Prakasham Cha, Parvarasim Cha. Because in that also, there is ki he who does not hit illumination, attachment or delusion when they are present or long for them when they disappear. Okay. Similar. Then Krishna like wants us to, like in this particular verse, he wants us to raise to the level of devotional service by this verse. Yes. And that, that 14 verse is is describing to come to devotional service that verse is 14 chapters karam yoga to take to the level of devotional service yes right yes thank you yes, the idea is to come to the mode of goodness take up devotional service okay. don't be attached to work but Devotional service doesn't mean give up work. It means work for Krishna, right? Devotional service is to work for Krishna. Now sannyasis, there's two kinds of sannyasis. You have Mayavari sannyasis or Ekadandi sannyasis from the line of Shankaracharya. They take sannyas to give up the world. But the Trudandi sannyasi, the Vaishnava sannyasi, he takes sannyas to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. So different consciousness in renouncing the world. The, the Mayavadi sannyasis, they reject the world. They say, Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, the world is false. So they give up all work. They give up, they're called like karma sannyasis, they renounce work. But the Vaishnava sannyas, he is his sannyas is different. His sannyas is to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. Nothing for sense gratification. All right? Yes, Prabhupada. Any other questions? We, if not, we'll go on. Text number 13. All right? Okay, text 13. Somebody like to read? All right, so we're going on to Jnana Yoga now. Jnana Yoga, knowledge. Lord Krishna is going to explain to us the five causes of the accomplishment of all action. Right? Who is the doer? Sometimes it's discussed, you know, who is the doer? Sometimes we hear the modes of nature are the doer. Sometimes we hear the living entity is the doer. Sometimes we hear that Krishna is the doer. Who is actually the doer? Who is responsible? So here, Lord Krishna is ex going to explain Sankhya. Sankhya is a type of jnana or knowledge. And he's going to explain the five causes of all action. Right? Sankhya. Well, I'll, we can read a little bit in the purport here. A question may be raised that since any activity performed must have some reaction, how is it that the person in Krishna consciousness does not suffer or enjoy the reactions of work? Right? We were saying Arjuna, if he fights, if he does it as karma yoga, there's no reaction. So the question is asked, why is there no reaction? So Krishna is describing to us, he's citing Vedanta philosophy to show how this is possible. He says there are five causes for all activities. And for success in all activity, one should consider the five causes. Sankhya means the stock of knowledge. And Vedanta is the final stock of knowledge, accepted by all leading acharyas. Even Shankara 
accepts Vedanta Sutra as such. Therefore, such authority should be consulted. Right? Vedanta. Veda means knowledge and Anta means the end. So Vedanta means the end of knowledge. So as Prabhupada said, it's the ultimate knowledge and it's accepted like that even by Shankaracharya. And we're going to hear. The ultimate control is invested in the super soul. As it is stated in Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Chaham Ridisani Vishtaha. He is engaging everyone in certain activities by reminding him of his past actions. And Krishna consciousness acts done under his direction from within yield no reaction either in this life or in the life after death. So Krishna conscious acts don't have any reaction because we did it in consciousness of Krishna. Krishna takes away the reaction. All right, we go ahead. Text number 14. All right. So, the place of action, the body, then the performer, or the 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 doer, the karta, the worker, the doer, and then the various senses, the different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. So these different factors will influence every activity. The body, the place of action, the body. Different, we have different bodies. Somebody has the strong body, somebody has the weak body, somebody has the healthy body, somebody has the sick body. The performer, the soul, the individual living entity. And then the various senses. We know some people have very powerful senses and some have weak senses, some have uh, good knowledge, some don't. Different kinds of endeavour. Certainly some actions we don't like to do it, so we don't endeavour very much. And sometimes we really endeavour, we're very attached, we really work hard. So the endeavour is also a factor. But ultimately, the super soul is a factor. That's the most important. So as described at the end of the purport there, in text 14, everything is dependent on the supreme will, the super soul, the supreme personality of Godhead. All right, go ahead, text 15. Whatever right or wrong action a man performs by body, mind or speech is caused by these five factors. Purport. Go ahead. The, wo the words right and wrong are very significant in this world. Right work is work done in terms of the prescribed directions in the scriptures. And wrong work is work done against the principles of the scriptural injection. But whatever is done requires these five factors for its complete, complete performance. Alright. So we can see the knowledge aspect coming about. We have to know what is the mood, what do the scriptures tell us? What is the instructions of the scriptures? You follow the scriptures, that's right work. You act against the scriptures, that's wrong. You did it the wrong way. You went against the scriptures. You go against the scriptures, you cannot expect to get good results. So we have to understand 
what is right and what is wrong, guided on the basis of scripture. Text number 16. Therefore, one who thinks himself the only doer, not considering the five factors, certainly not very intelligent and not see things as they are. Purport. Foolish person not understand that the super soul is sitting as a friend within and conducting his actions. Although the material causes are the place, the worker, the endeavor, and the senses, the final cause is the supreme, the personality of Godhead. Therefore, one should see not only the four material causes, but the supreme efficient cause as well. One who does not see the supreme thinks himself to be the doer. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, this is the ignorance of the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul is thinking, I did it, I did it. <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm the one, I'm the doer. But they're not seeing the fifth cause. The fifth cause is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord in the heart. It's the ultimate doer. So without his sanction, you cannot do anything. So we should remember the place, the worker, the endeavor, the senses, and ultimately the Supreme Lord. This is knowledge. This is the uh, knowledge determining the results of all action. Go ahead. Text 18. One who is not motivated by false ego, whose intelligence is not entangled, though he kills men in this world, does not kill, nor is he bound by his action. Thank you. So this is relevant very much to Arjuna's situation, who is on the battlefield, and he knows he has to take part in a battle, and there's going to be a lot of killing. So Lord Krishna mentions that though he kills men in this world, he does not kill, nor is he bound by his actions. So what is the example Prabhupada gives in this regard? There's a, an example we often give. Prabhupada gives in the purport here, at the end of the purport. The soldier. 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 Yes, go ahead, tell me. That uh, the, when the soldier is acting on behalf of his, uh, on, on behalf of his superior, then he, he can't be judged for that. But if he acts independently, then he, he will be tried for the same thing as a woman. Right. Yes. Someone may be employed by the government and their job may be, you know, like people who work in the police force, they may have the job of hanging a murderer or executing, the de executing a, a murderer, giving the death sentence. They have to kill people. But they're not considered murderers. They're doing their work. It's a government. It's a service. So the same way a soldier on the battlefield fighting, he may kill people, but he's honored. He's a hero. But if the same one comes back home and goes and gets fighting, and then he kills someone, then he's he's in big trouble. So the devotee is like that. Arjuna should think of himself like that. Arjuna thought himself to be the doer of action, but he did not consider the supreme sanction within and without. If one does not know that a su supreme sanction is there, why should he act? 
But one who knows the instruments of work, himself as the worker and the Supreme Lord, as the Supreme Sanctioner, is perfect in doing everything. Such a person is never in illusion. So, important to understand with the eye of knowledge, understand who is actually the doer. All right, so next section going on, knowledge, text 18, knowledge, the object of knowledge and the knower are the three factors that motivate action. The senses, work and the doer are the three constituents of action. So you have these two departments, you have the three factors that motivate action and you have the three constituents of action. Right? The constituents of action being work, the senses and the doer, and the factors which motivate action are knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower. And Lord Krishna is going to describe these things, how they are influenced by the modes of nature, knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower. Right? Text. 19 describes. Someone read text 19. According to the three different According to the three According to the three different modes of material nature, there are three kinds of knowledge, action and performer of action. Now hear of them from me. Go ahead, read a little of the purport. Purport. In the 14th chapter, the three divisions of the modes of material nature were elaborately described. In that chapter, it was said that the mode of goodness is illuminating, the mode of passion materialistic, and the mode of ignorance conducive to laziness and indolence. All the modes of material nature are binding. They are not sources of liberation. All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Haribo. All right. Thank you. Very enthusiastic reader. All right. Text number 20. We're hearing about knowledge and the mode of goodness. Please read text number 20, translation. That Maharaj. Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj. No, you carry on. That knowledge by which one undivided spiritual nature is seen in all living entities. Though they are divided into innumerable forms, you should understand to be in the mode of goodness. So can you describe it in simple language? What is this knowledge in the mode of goodness? Uh, that all, all, we all are souls. And we are all actually same in quality. And it's just our, um, oh, the, the material body that is just different. Right, yes, right. We have different material bodies, but we're all souls, right? And Prabhupada, or in the purpose, in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada talks about we have to create unity in diversity. He said the leaders of the Krishna consciousness movement were meant to come to Mayapur every year to create, to discuss how to create unity out of the, from the diversity. There's so much diversity, different bodies, different people, different races, different cultures, but we have to create unity and spiritual culture. That is the unity when we see everything on the spiritual platform. So that is actually the mode of goodness. Undiv one undivided spiritual nature in all living entities. 
Okay, then knowledge, we have, next one we have knowledge in the mode of passion, text 21. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, that knowledge by which one sees that in every different body there is a different type of living entity, you should understand to be in the mode of passion. All right. So you can see the difference in the mode of passion. You make distinction between different living entities. You see, in every different body, there's a different type of living entity. Right? Some people think, oh, the, the, the animals, they have no souls. Or the animal has an animal soul. So it's all right to kill them. They think like that. They cannot see the unity. But on the higher platform, they see the animals and the plants all as brothers and sisters. They don't think of them as being different. That's the mode of goodness. But in the mode of passion, they make distinction. Oh no, the bodies, no, they're different. Oh no, not that race. Oh no, not these people. Uh, we see everything in a very material manner. This is the mode of passion. They don't see the soul in the body. They can't see the unity. Then mode, knowledge in the mode of ignorance is described in text 22. And that knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work as the all in all, without knowledge of the truth, and which is very meager, it is said to be in the mode of darkness. Mm, thank you. Knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work as all in all, without knowledge of the truth. So, <laughs> Prabhupada explains, the knowledge of the common man is always in the mode of darkness or ignorance, because every living entity is in conditional life, is born into the mode of ignorance. One who does not develop knowledge through the authorities or scriptural injunctions has knowledge that is limited to the body. So people in the bodily concept of life, they're just animals. And Prabhupada goes on to talk about eating and sleeping, defending and mating. Yashyatma buddhi, right? Sa eva gochara, sa eva gokara, no better than the cow or the, the ass. If you think you're the body, you're just on the platform of the animal. So you have to transcend, we have to develop spiritual knowledge, spiritual education, very important. So we can see the difference, different kinds of knowledge. Somebody brought up the philosophy, they said, people say, work is worship. They say, work is worship. Well, yes, work is worship if you understand in the proper manner. But it's not that all work is worship. You cannot think that somebody is working in the, in the slaughterhouse or in the bar that their work is worship. Work is worship if one has a consciousness that everything belongs to God and I'm using, I'm doing it for service to God, then it can be worship. But it's not that all work is worship. And similarly, we're seeing here knowledge. There's first class knowledge in the mode of goodness, second class knowledge in the mode of passion and third-class knowledge, the mode of ignorance. So, one has to be properly educated. Not everybody gets the opportunity to get spiritual education. That's their karma. They didn't get, they didn't get the opportunity to hear scriptures. Okay, so knowledge has been described now, action is going to be described. Action in the modes. First of all, action in goodness. Text 23.
Please read. Oh, my battery. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Mataji. That action which is regulated and which is performed without attachment, without love and, or hatred, and without desire for fruitive results, is said to be in the mode of goodness. Shall I read the purport also? Yeah, you could do. Regulative occupational duties as prescribed in the scriptures in terms of the different orders and divisions of society performed without attachment or proprietary rights and therefore without any love or hatred and performed in Krishna consciousness for the satisfaction of the Supreme without self-satisfaction or self-gratification are called actions in the mode of goodness. All right. So working, One, we said work is worship. Yeah, if you work in the mode of goodness, then it can be close to worship. How to act in the, how to work in the mode of goodness? It should be regulated. It should be performed without attachment, without love or hatred, and without desire for results. <laughs> that that's a big thing. Most people work for the result to, to enjoy the result. But work in the mode of goodness, detached work, but regulated, not irregular, it should be regulated, just like we, have a, we give a lot of importance to regulation. In deity worship, it should be regulated. In eating meals should also be regulated. And we chant also japa, regulated number of rounds, like that. Go ahead, text 24. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj, mm -hmm. can we say that in this verse, Prabhupada is said to uh, also encourage the word Varnashram Dharma to follow Varnashram Dharma also? To follow Varnashram Dharma. Prabhupada is encouraging the purpose to follow Varnashram also. Which text are you on? This, this only, this text only. 24, 23? 23rd, 23rd, yes, Maharaj. Yes, regulated activities in terms of the different orders and divisions of society. All right. So, yes. So the orders and divisions of society, that's also regulating us, right? Regulation, certain work we should do. If you're a Vaishya, take care of the cows, protect the cows, and do business and trading. If you're a Kshatriya, you should be charitable and you should be giving protection to others. And the Brahmana is supposed to also study the scriptures and worship the deities and give charity and these kind of things. So there are different duties for different varnas and ashrams. So these activities should be regulated. In other words, you can't be a Brahmin one day and the next day a Kshatriya and the next day a Vaishya. If you're going to be a Brahmin, you should be a Brahmin. You don't just change one casually or haphazardly from one varna to another or from one ashram to another. Going through the ashrams also. You begin with brahmachari life, then there is grihastha life, then there is vanaprastha life, and then maybe even you go on to sannyas. So there's, there's regulation for that throughout the life. Different duties for the varnas and different ashrams according to the age and period of life which one is in. In the beginning, brahmachari training, very important. And then after brahmachari training, then some people will get married, become grihastas, and others may not. They may stay brahmacharis and go on to become sannyasis. Or they may just simply stay brahmacharis. 
but some people will become grihastas and grihastas will go on and become vanaprastas. They retire. They don't keep working all the time. They retire gradually because they have to prepare for the next life. So this is regulation within the life, not only on a daily basis, but just like there's regulation in the year, there's also regulation in the life. Is it clear? We'll go ahead, takes 24. Work in action in the mode of passion. Hare Krishna. But action performed with great effort by one seeking to gratify his desires and enacted from a sense of false ego is called action in the mode of passion. Right? Good. So, great effort. This is the nature of the mode of passion. Strong desires, a false ego. So, not difficult to identify the mode of passion. Yes, go ahead, Maharaji, please read 25. Yes, 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 Maharaj. That action performed in illusion is disregarded of scriptural injunctions and without concern for future bondage or for violence or distress caused to others is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Read the purple. Read the purple? Yes. One has to give account of one's actions to the state or to the agents of the Supreme Lord called the Yamadutas. Irresponsible work is destructive because it destroys the regulative principles of scriptural injunction. It is often based on violence and is distressing to other living entities. Such irresponsible work is carried out in the light of one's personal experience. This is called illusion. And all such illusory work is a product of the mode of ignorance. Hare. Can you think of any activities like this which are in the mode of ignorance? slaughterhouses, these active, I mean, should we, should that decide, Maharaj? Yes, that, of animals? yes I, I think that's the obvious answer. I think that's definitely the clear example here of the mode of ignorance, giving vi violence and causing pain to others and not thinking about our future also, how we have to be taken to Yamaraj to be responsible for our actions. People don't think about this. They do so much violence. Yes, Maharaj. And Maharaj, what about the um, animals which are used, you know, in the medical study, we uh, experiment on the animals and eventually they die. Yeah, this is also the mode of ignorance. Action in the mode of ignorance. We take the poor animals and do these cruel things to them. Yes, Maharaj. It's very bad. And similarly, you have also clinics where they're doing abortions. Yes, abortions, yes, Maharaj. And so there's a, a lot of these things going on in the world today when we think about it. And also those who are working in the deep mines and uh, those who are in, uh, involved in the uh, making of these crackers and those, uh, the dynamites, uh, because a lot of accidents happen in the process. All right, yes. A lot of lives are lost. Mm -hmm. So many dangers, people do these things. Yes. And also the circus, Maharaj, for the entertainment, the circus, they involve the animals, the people, and they go through dangerous uh, things, and also the dangerous sports. Dangerous sports? Like you have this paragliding and, uh, you know, uh, 
Just to review what we covered. Uh, Is anybody able to see it? Yes. You can see it? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, good. oh, good. Oh, okay. Okay, so revision of chapter 17. Do you remember? Can you give three qualities of food in the mode of goodness? Yes, Maharaj. Yes? It increases, increases the duration of one's life. Oh, that, that's one. Wait, let somebody else give the other. You give one. Increases the duration of life. What's another one? It's healthy, Maharaj. Healthy, okay. Another one? Healthy. What? What's he saying? To see. To see. He's saying juicy, juicy. Oh, juicy, juicy. Okay, juicy. All right. Is it? Is that one quality? Juicy. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Fatty and juicy. So increases increases the duration of life. Healthy yes. gives happiness and satisfaction. Gives happiness and satisfaction. Also purifies one's existence. Purifi purifies one's existence. Gives also strength. Right? Gives strength. What about some qual number two? Give some qualities of austerity of the body. Give one quality first. Can you think of one quality? Austerity of the body. Cleanliness. Cleanliness, okay, yes. Worship Supreme Lord. Worship of the Supreme Lord, yes. Simplicity. Simplicity. Is that one of the qualities mentioned? Yes. Celibacy. Sorry? Not expecting material benefits. Not ex Ganga Prasad Prabhu said celibacy. Celibacy. Celibacy, celibacy is a, one of the is, is the austerity of the body? Yes. Okay. Non violence. Non violence. Worship of spiritual master. Worship of the spiritual master, yes. We had worship of the Supreme Lord, worship of the spiritual master. Also, father, mother of the Brahmanas. Worship of the Brahmanas, worship of the father and mother. Okay. All right. And what about austerity of speech? What does that consist of? Regularly reciting Vedic scriptures. Okay, regularly reciting Vedic scriptures. Good. And another one? Truthful. Truthful and pleasing. Truthful and pleasing. Yes. Okay, truthful, pleasing, regular. 
Huh? Beneficial. What's he saying? Beneficial. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Here's the breakdown of the chapter. The first 12 verses, we were speaking about acting with detachment. How it brings freedom from reaction. It's true renunciation. And then we went on to the number two, conclusion of Sankhya and Vedanta. Actions are directed by the super soul. And that brings freedom from reaction. And now we're on part number three, the entanglement of the three modes. And it goes up to verse number 40. After that, we'll go on to hear about worshipping the Lord through one's occupational work. How that is true renunciation. And then from Jnana Yoga to pure devotional service. So the devotional service has not come yet, it comes later, second half of the chapter. We'll hear about working in pure devotional service, surrender to super soul, and go on to hear more aspects of transcendental knowledge. So what is the purpose of the renounced order of life, sannyas, and renunciation, tiaga? What, what is the purpose of sannyas? That we have to give up the activities of, of which are from our own, own desire, for, for material desire. We give up all fruitive work, right? Fruitive work. And renunciation? What, what is the purpose of renunciation? Giving up result of all activities. Giving up the attachment to the results. Here you see Srila Prabhupada. This is when Prabhupada took sannyas, and this was his sannyas guru. His sannyas guru was Bhakti Keshava, Bhakti Pragna Keshava Maharaj. He was a god brother. He was also disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. So he gave Prabhupada, he initiated Prabhupada sannyas. And he, he has an ashram over in Navadweep. And this, this person, this an, another elderly man, he took sannyas the same day with Srila Prabhupada. They both accepted sannyas from Keshava Pragna Maharaj. So that's renunciation, renounced order of life. Is it possible that these two are similar in purpose or even the same? Is it possible? Sannyas is the same as Chyaga? Yes. What do you say, everybody? Nobody know? There seems to be some distinction. Some distinction? Yes. Okay, what distinction is there? Okay, anyway, let's go ahead. Let's see. Wise men say, sannyas means giving up activities based on material desire. Tiaga, renunciation, means giving up results of all activities, right? So sannyas is giving up activities based on material and desire, and tiaga is giving up results of all activities. Conclusion, give up the results of all activities by offering them to Krishna. Only do activities that are for the purpose of devotional service. For working in this way and offering the fruit to him in devotional service is purifying and is free from karmic reaction. So, on the left side we have all types of fruit of acts should be given up. All types of fruit of acts. What's that? Is that Tiago or Sanyas? Sanyas? Sanyas Maharaj. 
And over here, acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be given up. So are they the same? No, they are the same. Come on, look at the scales. They're equal. They're equal. They're the same. All types of fruit of acts should be given up. Sacrifice, charity and penance should never be given up. Sacrifice, charity and penance should not be done as a fruit of activity. It's done for the service of Krishna. Then it's the same. Should never be given up. Then it's the same. Acts of charity and oh, acts of charity and service in goodness, which purify one, should never be given up. You see the example here. What's the example? Marriage. The marriage. The the vivaha yagya shouldn't be given up. It purifies young people. And here you see, charity, Vamanadev, taking charity from Bali Maharaj, purifying. Do these acts as a matter of duty, without attachment to the fruit, and free from material association. So we don't give up. Renunciation of prescribed duties because they are troublesome or interfere with bodily comfort is in the mode of passion. <laughs> and here you have the lady, she's about to bathe. She says, I refuse to bathe until they release a 100% waterproof phone case so I can text in there. <laughs> so she wants she must be able to use her handphone when she's in her bath. All right? Are some people like that? Probably. Yes, mm -hmm. So, that renunciation, that's the mode of passion. Here's the mode of ignorance. Renunciation of prescribed duties due to illusion is in the mode of ignorance, right? You can see the man with his son in the mode of ignorance, dirty, unkempt, his body's all covered in tattoos from head to foot, he has a child with him, the mode of ignorance. Then we spoke about people who are not renounced, so they enjoy the fruits of action. Some fruit is good and some fruit is not good and some fruit is mixed. So this is the result. When one is not renounced, you haven't renounced the fruit of action. You want to enjoy the fruit of action, so this is what you get. You get some good, you get some bad. It's not very pleasant. The good comes with the bad. You see the foot coming down on the man's head? When the foot is bringing unhappiness, ignorance, violence, illusion, these kind of things, not very desirable. So that's based on text number 12. And then we spoke about text 13 was describing good and bad or mixed reactions compared to a rose, but the rose has also thorns. You get these thorns, they stick in your fingers, painful. You may enjoy the rose, so very beautiful, nice smell, very fragrant, beautiful to look at, but they have these thorns, which are really, if they stick in your finger, it's painful, it's nasty. So it's like that. And then here is the Sankhya, the summary of Gyan, five causes of action, the place of action, the body, the performer, the conditioned soul, the various senses, the varieties of work or endeavor, and 
the super soul, the five causes of action. Okay? So we spoke about these things and Okay, did you see that clearly? Watch again. Watch again. What is the illusion? The illusion is, I am the only doer. We're thinking. And here, here's our soldier example, no reaction from the government, the man is fighting in the war, no reaction for the government, but another case, he gets reaction. Somebody else, another time fighting, there's reaction. So this is the nature of work or action, when you act for, on behalf of the Supreme Government, the Universal Government, there's no reaction, Karma Yoga. Okay, we'll stop here tonight. Are there any other questions? Anybody has any question? I reward you accordingly in that proportion. You know, Krishna says like that. Yeah, he's talking about devote somebody who surrenders to him. So in proportion to surrender to Krishna, you get result. But when we work karma yoga, detached work, it's detached work. We're, we're mam prapajante is describing working for Krishna. We're attached to Krishna. So we get results from Krishna. But karma yoga is detached work. Detached work. You're sim simply working out of duty. Yes, Maharaj. So it's a, a different consciousness. But the devotee is working for Krishna. And Krishna appreciates. So according to their surrender, they'll get some result. Hmm? Uh, but that's according to our absorption in the activity, like how much we are absorbed in one activity, like uh, according to that we will get it. Yes, yeah. Certainly our attitude is very important. We have to work in devotion, right? We say devotional service. It's not just service. But it's devotional service. So the attitude has to be that, that we're working with love. Just like when we do our chanting, we have to chant with love, with quality from the heart. We're calling Krishna, calling the holy name. So it's, it's, the, the attitude is very important. And Krishna knows the heart. He, knows, he understands our heart. What is our mood in performing the service. He knows, are we doing it grudgingly? If you perform actions grudgingly, you know, that's the mode of ignorance or passion. Mm -hmm. Next 
Krishna Prabhu. Asim Krishna Prabhu, yes. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, sorry. Maharaj, out of the five factors for the cause of any action, the doer, is it the soul or the mind? The doer is the soul. Soul who is conditioned in pure consciousness soul wants only service of the Lord. Yes, the soul. The soul, we could say the soul is conditioned, yes, but still the soul is what's mentioned. We mentioned the five senses and they mentioned the body, the place, the place is the body. The endeavor, you see, the endeavor will be influenced by the mind. That's going to be the coming from the mind, the particular endeavor which we make. That will be related to the mind, the mental condition. Okay, Maharaj, then soul, then the doer is the soul. Yes, the soul. Yes, Maharaj. You could say our soul is always pure, but it comes in contact with the modes of nature. Our consciousness becomes polluted. So consciousness, <laughs> we could talk, whereas the con consciousness is concerned, you could say that's affected by the, the attitude or the endeavor. The endeavor also would be influenced, the consciousness. It's Anyway, the main point, the main factor is the super-soul. From the Sankhya philosophy, what we understand, the important point is the super-soul. These other factors are not dominate, they're not so prominent. What is, impro what is prominent is the influence of the super-soul, ultimately. It's Krishna as the super-soul who really ultimately determines every action. Other factors are secondary. So the soul, the senses, these things are all secondary compared to the super soul. And it's the super soul who is yes. the overseer, the permitter, right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. So can you say for the liberated person, the soul plays a greater role and for a bounded person like us, our endeavor of the mind plays a greater role? No, we say the super soul plays the greatest endeavor. Endeavor, and our endeavor, it may be, it may vary. Of course, it will vary different, different, depends what we're doing. Something may, you know, the senses are also there. How do our senses perceive it? Is it something we really like to do or something we don't like to do? Our senses, our, our, the soul, hmm, the body. <laughs> it's it's a, a real analytical issue, you know, to understand the influence of each of the factors. They all have their part, they all play some part. So how much part they play, difficult to know, but we're told ultimately the main factor is the super-soul. That's what we're learning from the Bhagavad Gita, that ultimately don't overlook the, issue, the effect of the super-soul, which is the predominating factor. And other things are all subordinate to the super-soul. Oh really? Yeah. Maharaj, like uh, about giving charity in India, there is a very is, there is a practice like at the marriage of a son or some grah pravesh or some opening of some shop etc. There are kinners and they are given charity. They are given so much charity like like gold chain or even fifty thousand cash, so much large large amounts and people. Um, uh, mostly all people give them because of their, because they are afraid that because these people curse them. 
otherwise so and some people say that it's our duty to give to such people because uh, they are not capable of earning and to uh, take their livelihood so uh, Farah, what what should we do in this case you mean at the time of marriage you have to give charity to kinners there are people who are half men half half women they are kinners so oh. they give charity to them in thousands lakhs of rupees they are given and if you don't give they they really curse you and they they are in a practice of they they have a habit and they i don't know but they come to know if there is a marriage in some house or if there is a child especially a boy child is born in a family in india it's a practice they give it's a, everybody gives it's not like someone will not give like mm. well then this is charity of course this is charity in the mode of ignorance to give these kind of people charity you may have to give there may be some obligation on your part to that you have to give them something but as much as possible you want to try to avoid that kind of charity these people who come there yeah i've seen these kind of people they're they're like eunuchs or something right they're not men not women or but they they're 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 men but they're in women bodies dressed as women or something and they come to marriages and they and people people tend to encourage them by giving them charity mm. so what to do in those situations <laughs> try to avoid them <laughs> what can i say just try to avoid them you Maharaj. Maharaj, what I find in these uh, five factors of action, um, obviously we have this senses also. We have to know from chapter two how senses influence the mind as well as influence uh, the intelligence. Now, my question is, if super soul is supposed to be the most important factor, so and thus, and uh, he is allowing the senses to be uh, like uh, influencing the actions. Why is it so? Well, material body means we have senses. So we, we have to have senses, we use the senses for knowledge and for working. So the senses are part of the, part of life. You can't have a body without senses. So we have to, we have to understand the need for senses to perform ac actions. We need this, these senses. And so they also have a part to play in performing actions. Whereas that means, I mean, as, a, as performers, we have, when we are bound up by the senses, this is what is clearly coming out of these five factors. And although there is super soul, who, whose supreme will actually like plays a major role, but uh, that in, in such a situation, as performers, I mean, while we are supposed to be doing a particular type of work, we are forced to do uh, mundane activities. Is that correct understanding? Well, due to conditioning, we may have to perform mundane activities. We don't have to perform mundane activities. We can, we can use the body to transcend, to perform transcendental activities do everything in Krishna consciousness, it's not mundane. We use the senses, but the senses are used in the service of Krishna, they, they can, it, can be, it can be purifying. The senses are Krishna's property, right? Krishna is Rishikesh, he gives us his senses, so we should use them for his service. It's not mundane, transcendental. 
to use the senses in the service of Krishna. And by the senses we can understand Krishna, right? We use the tongue to chant the holy name. We use the tongue to taste prasada. So we use the senses in the service of Krishna. We, with the eyes we can see the deity. With the nose we can smell the flowers offered to Krishna. With the ears we can hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Without the senses we couldn't do these activities. So senses used in the service of Krishna are elevating. Maharaj, we, we have come to know from the first, from chapter 2 and 3, especially chapter 2, how can these senses lead to lust. And that means a performer is forced to be involved in lust, lusty activities. Yes, I understand. If we can transcend, that is a, that is a method come out of lust but mm, deep inside if there is lust then what what can one do well by engaging in devotional activities by using the senses for the service of krishna that lust which is deep inside of us can be purified it can be removed right we'd simply do devotional service you do devotional service and that lust, even which is deep-rooted in the heart, it will be removed. It will all be taken out by devotion, by contact with Krishna. Just like the metal rod is put in the fire, gradually it will also become like fire. So the deep-rooted lust will be removed by the process of bhakti yoga. And we experience that, we should be experiencing that. By engaging in Krishna's service, the lust is removed from the heart. It less, becomes less and less. And finally one day we'll get the root, we'll get the whole root out. We'll get rid of all that lust. We'll awaken our real love. Gradually as we go on in devotional service, we develop more and more love for Krishna and less and less desire to enjoy material world. Hare Krishna. So we just have to continue to engage hearing and chanting and gradually everything will be re reduced. Okay, no more questions? Mm, Shilpashya Mataji, do you have any question? Your hand was raised. Yeah, I did have, uh, of course, Guru Maharaj did speak a bit about it. Uh, but Guru Maharaj, today we had a Bhagavad Gita reading and we were we are on chapter 14 and we were speaking about uh, also the modes of nature. So we were speaking about death in the mode of ignorance. And then, oh, how, as we had discussed in our Bhakti Shastri also, like one of the way, one of the example of death in the mode of ignorance is suicide. So then they started saying, well, why, why does the person have to be punished if they commit suicide? Because then it has to be under the will of the, of the Supreme Lord, since everything is under his will. So maybe it was meant for this person to end his life in this way. You know, it was already chosen. So, so how do you explain that? Well, the point is that the living entity acted independently of the will of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord had given the body to that person, but that person had committed suicide. He decided he didn't want the body. So that was, the act of, that was an act against the will of the Lord. The Lord had given him the body, but he destroyed it by committing suicide. So that's an action against the plan of the Lord. And that action is putting oneself into an a, a inauspicious condition. You, you don't want the body which is given to you, so you don't get a body in the next life. Because you commit suicide, and so the, the, the people who generally commit suicide, they may become ghosts. Usually they're given a ghost body in the next life. They're, they're left with the subtle body with no gross body. 
because when they had a gross body, they didn't want it. They destroyed it by committing suicide. So next time they're just left with a, a subtle body and they have to be his ghost. That's the punishment. So that was their own willing. They didn't want the gross body, so they're not given one. They're left in a subtle body, a subtle form. That's their punishment. And you could say it's their punishment, but that was their desire. They didn't want a physical body. It, they did it. It wasn't the Lord punished them, it was their doing. Right? They destroyed their body. So they don't need it. Okay, they don't want a body. Okay, don't have a body. Just stay in your subtle form. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. That's clear. Thank uh, you. Uh -huh. Okay. So we'll stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Gore back to Vrinda Ki.